Uh, asthma becomes a very important topic for uh, for anyone doing critical care medicine. Uh, it is a very important topic. Why is it an important topic? Because it is one of those conditions which can which can which can go very bad very quickly. It's one of those conditions that can go very bad very quickly. And a seemingly normal person, you must understand, asthma is a reactive airway disease seen in younger individuals rather than older COPD patients. Okay, a seemingly normal patient will become abnormal and die. You understand? Because these patients are usually having exacerbations. They are otherwise not ill. Otherwise they are normal. For example, if a person has got exercise induced asthma, he is normally doing his work. He goes for an exercise, has an asthma and dies. You understand? He is otherwise normal. It's not like a patient in sepsis that is worsening, 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 delay, delay, no. This person is normal and then he comes to you with exacerbation and he goes down. By definition, what is asthma? What do you feel asthma is all about? So, Rujika, if I ask you what about asthma, what is it all about? If I ask you, what is asthma all about? What did you tell? Um, hyper inflated. When I say asthma, what comes to your mind? So, you can be what, whatever you want to say, what comes to your mind? Obstructive. Obstructive airways. airways. Yeah, so that is the first thing that should come to your mind. That there is an obstruction in the airway. Everything that occurs uh, is because of an obstruction in the airway. Then, what else comes to your mind? Hyper you find there is a hyper reactive yeah. airway. Okay, there is an obstructed airway, probably because of a hyper reactive airway. Then, what comes to your mind? Mucus. mucus plugging should not come to your mind because mucus plugging is not something that you see in asthma. You see more of in COPD mucus plugging with pneumonia. That should not come to your mind. Then reversibility. Reversibility should so come to your mind. And in comparison to COPD, it is reversible. In comparison to COPD, you can tighten the COPD. Huh? No, you can tighten it. Huh? In comparison to uh, in comparison to uh, uh, COPD, it is reversible. Okay. Then, then what comes to your mind? Anything else that comes to your mind? Tell me something with the anatomy. Anything with the anatomy that, that comes to your mind? Small to medium I size airway and more. That's easy to say. Hyperreactive airways and you're right. Small to medium size airways and more. Apart from that, anything different? Anything different? What comes to your mind when you see a patient of asthma? Sorry? Wheezing. wheezing. Yeah, you see wheezing. That's right. You see wheezing. So the first thing I'm thinking is wheezing. I mean, clinically, I'm feeling there's wheezing. Then? Tachypnea. Yeah, there's tachypnea. Very important. So there's more than tachypnea, there's dyspnea, isn't dyspnea. it? Difficulty in breathing. Difficulty in breathing. So it's it's a small difference between tachypnea and dyspnea. When I say dyspnea, it means it's a difficulty in breathing. And when I say tachypnea, it means there's an increase in the respiratory rate. Two different things. And one is profoundly important in asthma, which is profoundly important. Dyspnea. Yes, dyspnea. It's different from tachypnea. So you can't say tachypnea because dyspnea is more profound. Difficulty in breathing becomes more profound. Clear? Yeah. We'll come to as to why it should be more profound. Okay. Uh, so what is why is it more profound? Why is uh, why is dyspnea more profound than tachypnea? So that comes to the anatomy. Okay. What is happening? What is happening in asthma is the fact that there is going to be an airway. There's going to be an airway that is very fast collapsing. It may be either collapsing during expiration or it is collapsing during inspiration more of or it is collapsed all the time and it is taking time to inflate. Uh, what does that cause? What does that cause? That prevents your air from inside the alveoli from getting outside the alveoli. It prevents the air that has gone into the alveoli to come out. Because say I have an airway, I have an alveoli, I am putting 500 ml inside, I am putting 500 ml outside. Okay, the time required for this going out should be higher because the area has become smaller. Okay, so it is obvious that if a person is in asthma and getting exacerbated, this is even more getting thinner. Till now he was conscious, till now he was obeying commands, uh, and then he becomes dyspneic. Why does he become dyspneic? He becomes dyspneic because of A, the reason being, the reason being that he is unable to actually get off this air. So you have you have the airway, you have the alveoli. In pictorially, what we are doing, we are pushing in 500 ml of air. Okay, when he is giving this 500 ml of air, there is a pressure exerted on this. There is a pressure exerted on this. Now, when he is breathing, when he is breathing in or breathing out, these airways are actually collapsing. 
more so in the inspiration it is an active thing so these airways are actually opening up because it's active but when it's passive what is normally keeping these airways open is these small small connections with different different alveoli there are other alveoli connections so this is keeping it open this is keeping it open right but what is happening in asthma is what is happening in asthma is even this is going off so rather than keeping it open rather than keeping it open these airways are actually collapsing you are understanding huh so if i were actually going to give 500 ml inside it was collapsed it was this much and in expiration in expiration what is happening is unfortunately this is collapsing the fire ml to come outside will take a larger amount of time <clears throat> and when it takes a larger amount of time this air that remains inside the alveolus exerts a pressure on this wall so slowly 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 the alveolus instead of collapsing completely the alveolus remains expanded right and this pressure all over the lung expands expands such that now the diaphragm which is supposed to lie like this inside the chest cavity because of the expansion that is occurring will start getting flattened flattened the only way these diaphragms can work is at inspiration this has to go down when this goes down when this goes down that is when the patient gets an inspiratory breath now if the diaphragm is already down you know first of all what has happened he is unable to breathe out since he is unable to breathe out he is unable to breathe in since he is unable to breathe out he is unable to breathe in pain now he is getting he is getting distinct difficulty to breathe in on top of it the more effort that he is taking the output for that effort is much lesser because the diaphragm is only going to go this much so he may breathe his level best he may breathe his level best huh? but still he cannot force air inside his airway he cannot force inside air, air inside his airway you are understanding he cannot force why because the mechanical properties of the diaphragm are lost the mechanical properties of the diaphragm are lost specifically because of this effect that has occurred you are understanding that is why this patient has got and that's why dyspnea will become more important than tachypnea you understand after dyspnea he will become tachypneic clear so the first thing that will occur is difficulty in breathing so can somebody explain why it difficult in breathing was such a why tell me uh, so because uh, due to the pressure of the With this build up in the alveoli, so it may, makes the why the pressure is building up in the alveoli because it is not the amount of air is coming is not going out. That yes, way. okay. So that's why the pressure is built up, and that is creating pressure on the diaphragm. Ah, huh. so and why is this not going out? Because, because those connections, a, inter uh, a small airway connections are lost. Lost. So because of it, it's collapsing. Collapsing. Okay. Clear on this. So uh, and then because of this, what happened to diaphragm? Diaphragm is the mechanical uh, down. So there, there is no. that much space as was previously so ha uh, there is not so much of leverage the for the diaphragm to actually inspire inspire ha uh, and that is why whatever you do to this patient whatever you do to this patient unless you open up this airway this is not going to improve unless you open up this airway this is not going to improve so in fact in fact what you must understand by this what i am talking to you is if this patient worsens quickly he dies quickly why is that so it because if he gets anxious the first thing he will happen is anxious anxiety right what is the first thing that happen to this patient i can't breathe okay i can't breathe that's the first thing that happen so he gets anxiety what does this anxiety do this anxiety causes the patient to breathe Faster. Faster. Right. Now, once the patient breathes faster, what happens to his expiratory time? Yes. Yes. Let's take the example. You have a patient at a respiratory rate of ten versus a patient with a respiratory rate of thirty. I keep my eye ratio as one is to two. Let's take the example. 
Okay. Now this means how much second inspiration? Six. Six seconds. Six seconds. Total breath cycle. Me. Two seconds is inspiration, and four seconds is expiration. This is clear. This is clear. How I got this is clear. Now, when there are thirty breaths, thirty divided by sixty is how much? One. So point five seconds ka. No, no. I mean, uh, how much seconds is one breath? Two seconds. Two seconds. In sixty minutes, two seconds ka ek breath aata hai, right? Now this two seconds, I am now going to make it. Uh, I have to make it one is to two. So how much will that be? Somewhere around point five. Five. Point five. Not point five. One is to two. So it's point seven and one point three or something like that. Huh? What does effectively happen? Expiratory time has become one third. Expiratory time has become one third. So if the expiratory time becomes one third, this problem gets exacerbated. This problem gets exacerbated. Okay, and that's why anxiety, dyspnea, tachypnea, worsening of condition, more amount of dynamic hyperinflation, heart arrest. Clear on that? Do you understand this? Okay. It's very important to understand this. Very, very important because our treatment is directed to this. Uh, each and every treatment of ours is directed to this cycle. Okay. So what does it say? A patient who is getting an acute exacerbation of asthma initially will get anxious because his mechanical properties of his lung are not okay. And since his mechanical properties are not okay, he is getting anxious. He is getting slightly difficult. Right? Clear? Yeah. Huh? Now this is causing him to become dyspneic. Huh? It's been difficulty to breathe. Now the difficulty to breathe, the body is unable to generate the tidal volume. So what it will do? It will increase the RR. So it will increase the RR. So it increases, makes it tachypneic. Tachypneic. What does it do? It actually drops your expiratory time. Since it drops your expiratory time, there is going to be more amount of dynamic in your hyperinflation. Higher the dynamic inflammation, lesser the vein is return. Cardiac arrest. Dynamic inflammation make the lungs go bigger and bigger. The intrathoracic pressure will keep on increasing, increasing to an extent that the vein is return into the heart will come down, and that will cause cardiac arrest. Clear? Any doubts on this? Clear? Yeah. No, right? Huh? So this you must understand first, first and foremost. Okay, this is what is occurring. Okay, which is which is why you will. Direct your treatment towards any of these things. <coughs> Clear? Any doubts till now? No. So when we when we are reaching this phase, we are going to see our patient not here. We are not going to see it here. We may see here, but we will rather see it here. Our patients are not going to be that patient who is just listening at home and get a pump and become fine. Uh, it's going to be our patient going to be the one that is actually going to be in a situation where he is about to arrest. So understand why he is arresting, right? This, this is without sugar. Now. Yeah. Why is arresting? The dynamic hyperinflation reduces the venous return. How does it reduce venous return? More intrathoracic pressure causing. Tell me. More and more intrathoracic pressure reduces venous return to heart and. Both the things it does. What does it do? Uh, whenever there is going to be higher amount of intrathoracic pressure, our uh, our blood is coming from our legs, from our IVC into our heart because the heart, right heart, is at a lower pressure. Because the right heart is at a lower pressure. That is why the blood is moving from outside to inside. Okay. The moment I increase my pressure in my heart, uh, uh, my vein is return will come down. External pressure that causes because of dynamic hyperinflation. Will actually cause the venous return to thus reduce. Not only that, when it presses on the, uh, uh, when it actually does that excessive hyperinflation, the pulmonary circulation gets compressed. When the pulmonary circulation gets compressed, the left heart also has a difficulty in pushing. Both together will now develop a cardiac arrest. Clear? So it's both the hearts that both the sides of the hearts that leads to a Cardiac arrest. arrest. Clear? Clear on this? So that's the slight difference between an auto peep and a dynamic hyperinflation. So can somebody tell me the difference between both of them? 
So we just talk about order piece, right? What, uh, what is order piece? It's intrinsic piece, the pressure that you are seeing over here because air is not coming out. What is dynamic hyperinflation? Tidal volumes. With every breath, there is a collapse of the airway dynamically. Why? Because these adjustments are gone, these, tr these stents have gone, the airway is now collapsing and with every breath. So a dynamic hyperinflation does not need auto peep, it is not equal to auto peep. A dynamic infl uh, inflation is a process that will lead to auto -pain. So don't interchange these. When I, I can interchange occult P, I can change auto P, I can uh, interchange intrinsic P. They are the same thing. So what are the three same things? The three same things that we have is intrinsic P, intrinsic P, auto P, and occult P. So anywhere you see any of these words, occult P, intrinsic P, or auto P, it means the same thing. Clear? So you might have various, various uh, uh, when you read books, you'll have various ways they are mentioning it in various books. But what you must understand, they all mean the same. But dynamic hyperinflation, dynamic hyperinflation can occur without auto P. You understand me? A dynamic hyperinflation, is not equal to auto P or intrinsic P or occult P. It will lead, eventually dynamic hyperinflation will lead to an auto P. But that doesn't mean at this particular moment this patient has got dynamic, this patient has got, if he has dynamic, he has auto P. You understand? For example, if a patient has got extreme airway distress, uh, his airways are going to go down because he's dynamically Hyper, uh, dynamically, his airways are reducing and his airway is hyperinflating. That will make him dysnic, but that may not generate autopy. Are you understanding? It may cause make you mismatches, but it may not cause autopy. So you can have dynamic hyperinflation without autopy, which is a process which will eventually lead to autopy. Clear? Any doubts here? Any doubts? Any doubts? It can be vice versa. Vice versa, that means dynamic hyperinflation or auto peep. Auto peep will not generate without a dynamic hyperinflation. There has to be a hyperinflation occurring. Hyper this will develop only when my alveolus becomes big. You understand? It will develop only when my alveolus becomes big, distended. That is this pressure that you are seeing as auto peep. You are understanding? Huh? Whereas dynamic hyperinflation can be a process occurring in your body. Which is making you difficult, making it difficult for you to breathe. Clear on this? Huh? Clear? Because auto beep is not only formed by, by the patient, it can be formed by the ventilator also. That is why I am saying there are two different processes. Let me explain this once more to you. Dynamic hyperinflation, dynamic means patient is doing something. Patient is doing something, right? Or there is an active process going on. That's dynamic. Right. So what is happening over there? There is a patient who is breathing excessively. His stirrups, his the, the 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 connections that are keeping his small airways open are collapsing. That is dynamic hyperinflation. That will lead to auto peak. But you have another patient. You have a tidal volume that you have set as two liters or one liter. His his patient weight is thirty eight kilos. Patient weight is thirty eight kilos. You have kept the RR as twenty. This patient, what is happening for this patient? Ye patient ko one liter tidal volume rakha hai hai, when he requires not more than 250 or maybe at the best, even if it's 8 ml per kilogram, it is something like 400, 300 ml. You have given 1 liter uh, and you have kept an RR of 20. That means 1 liter is supposed to go in and 1 liter is supposed to come out. Here there is no dynamic hyperinflation. But what has happened? Because of your setting, then the volume has actually increased which has increased the pressure to go up and so you have okay. so this could be an iatrogenically related problem auto peak whereas dynamic hyperinflation is something that occurs because of an active contraction of the small airways huh? so there are many things that you don't understand even before going after going for exams sir. you need to understand these things huh? clear?
Any queries on this? Because tomorrow you should not feel that you must not feel that dynamic type interface means auto feed. It's not that. This is what we started. By everyone felt dynamic interface equal auto feed. It's not. Clear on that? Hmm? Any doubts here? So what is happening to the connection? Like why is that getting destroyed? Which is causing the so what what we are saying is in asthma, slowly, 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 there is some amount of problems that are occurring because of inflammation. That inflammation per se is actually destroying the airway anatomy, small airway anatomy. Okay, the small airway anatomy is remained open because of those connections. Mm -hmm. Now, dire dire those connections are going haywire. There is some structural lung disease that is occurring at the moment reversible. Okay. You know, when this progresses to an extent that it becomes irreversible, it becomes COPD. Are you understanding? Huh? So, this is what is occurring. Because one of the stage of corner is inflammation, that's why we give anti inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Clear? Any doubts on the difference between dynamic hyperinflation and autopy? No, right? Okay, so now, now, so when we are coming, so this will cause your patient to go into a cardiac arrest. Huh? Now, that is what is near fatal asthma. When I say near fatal asthma, is that condition of the patient where your PCO2 is 50. Dr. Vajanti said ABG. What does the ABG? The ABG is alkalotic. You have PCO2s that are going to be on the lower side. You have PCO2s that are going to be 20, 18, 17. Why because it's tachypnic? It's tachypnic. Huh? But if you do is ETCO2, no? if you do is actually uh, uh, ETCO2, ETCO2 will be a small, there will be a huge gap between your PCO2 uh, and your ETCO2. You understand? Huh? The gap will be, not only that, your PCO2s in the start of asthma would be on the lower side. You are not going to be seeing this patient like this. You are probably going to be seeing a patient whose PCO2 has become normal. His PCO2 has become normal. His or her PCO2 has become normal. If his PCO2 has become normal and he is breathless or he is loperic dyspnea, that is going towards fatality. That is going towards fatality. So, when your PCO2 becomes 50 or the patient has had a cardiac arrest or hemodynamic instability, this is called as near fatal asthma. This is called as near fatal asthma. Clear? You understood? So, let's, let's go back to the question is, why is the ETCO2 going up? Is that a question? Yes, PCO2 Okay, difference is because the giant is going to be done. Okay, what is happening? Why is the PCO2 changing? Why is the PCO2 getting retained? That's the question, right? Why is it getting retained? So what is happening over here? What is happening over here? Because this is getting inflamed and inflamed. Here, this pulmonary, from where is it going to come? Right heart, left heart. Right heart, left heart. Can you comment outside? Left heart. Huh? It will. It has to. What is normally occurring? Right heart is carrying carbon dioxide. Right uh, from the right side, carbon dioxide gets exchanged over here. Oxygen gets inside this, and the left heart gets oxygenated. Blood. This is what is occurring normally. Clear? Now what has happened? Now what has happened is in our patient we are having a situation where this idle volume we have given as 500. We are giving standard volume as 500. How much is that? 500 ml. However, the whole 500 ml is not going out. Going in and coming out. A whole 500 ml is not going in and coming out. The dead space of each one of us sitting here is 2.2 ml a kilogram. Let's take it as 6, 70 kilos. So, 7 twos of 14, 7 to 14, 15, 154 ml out of this 500 ml is anyways gone. 346 is all the remaining bit. Okay, now in this 346, it is going inside and coming outside. What is happening over here? Because of this effect, the gas exchange is not happening. You understand? Uh, out of the air that is going inside, only some part of the air is actually looking at gas exchange, whereas the rest is. So, what is happening is 500 ml is going in, but whole 500 ml is not coming out. That means to say the entire gas is not getting exchanged. So, if the gas is not exchanged, what is happening? This, this gas with carbon dioxide is going further. You understand? Huh? So the ETCO2 coming out is actually less. Because cardiac output speed comes. So there the exchange is not okay. The exchange is not okay. 
Moreover, the problems will come when we actually manage this. So we'll come to that in a, in a while. You, you, uh, so the problems will come when we actually try to manage this situation. We have not even started managing this as of now. Okay, we are in the situation where we are trying to understand what is the pathophysiology in the first place. Okay, so near fetal asthma, what is happening is PCO2 is going up. Why is the PCO2 going up? Because there is no gas exchange, diaphragm is unable to contract. So your PCO2 oxygen doesn't really have a problem because our oxygen hemoglobin dissociation system is like this. So you have a huge leeway before saturation drops. Huge leeway before saturation drops. Before saturation drops, huge, huge leeway. Saturation drops. So there is a long time before the saturation drops. So the saturation always is uh, is good. But uh, the carbon dioxide is something that will drop like that. It is not like this. Or it's not a curve. So it will drop the moment the ventilation goes down. It will, it will drop the moment the cardiac output goes, goes down. That's why when you do a CPR, your improvement in or return of circulation is suggested by an increase in the ETC. That is why we take that effect by putting in a tube and we know that there is no ETCO2 coming out, so we know it's in the esophagus. Because ETCO2 is more regularly coming in rather than saturation. So if you have a saturation on board and D-ray, D-ray, D-ray coming in, so today if I even close my mouth for a period of say uh, 15, 20 minutes, or even, even 5 to 6 minutes, huh? my carbon dioxide will come down, but my oxygen will take 5 to 6 minutes for it to come down. You are understanding? Because oxygen takes a while before it actually goes down, becomes cyanosis and things like that. Got the point? Uh, so that's why it is sort of reflected very important. That's why in the near fetal asthma, you don't have hypoxia. What do you have? Carbon dioxide. In when you say near fetal asthma, we're talking about a patient who's about to go into cardiac arrest, but with a PCO2 that is more than 50. It is not saying if the patient's PO2 is less than 50. You got the point? Uh, comment, comment. Pause it for now. Uh, asthma now. We have understood what is, what is the situation with near fetal asthma. Now the question that comes is, Okay, you have a patient that has come with near fetal asthma or a patient who is basically having a saturation of 100%. I told you, as I told you, I am not worried about saturation, but you have a PCO2 that has reached 32. Am I worried? Yes, I am. PCO2 is 32, but I am worried. Why am I worried? Because I would have expected the PCO2 to be 18. With that respiratory rate, with that respiratory rate, if you bring, <laughs> whatever, I have my PCO2 to be 12 and 10 or 9 or something. But if you are breathing at that rate and the CTC is not to 32, means what is the problem? Gas exchange. The problem is gas exchange. The other problem is gas exchange. Very quickly, this patient is going to go into a situation where he is going to arrest because of pressure symptoms, not because of pH, because of pressure symptoms. You understand? You are not, he is not going to arrest because his EBG has become 7.1. He is going to arrest because of the fact that he has probably developed so much of pressure so much of pressure in this chest that there is dynamic impact so much that there is uh, no venous return in the status. Presently, his blood pressure is normal because he is having excessive sympathetic activity. It is like giving noradrenaline. Because he is having excessive sympathetic activity, so giving noradrenaline, that is why his blood pressure is maintained. Uh, his adrenaline is working very, very high. And that is why he is maintained. Are you understanding? Huh? But very soon, he is going to arrest. Decompensation is going to occur when it reaches like this 32, 40, huh? 44. So you should be worried when something like this happens. Clear? Huh? Clear? So we are in this situation. Now, how do we get this patient out of this very difficult situation? How do we get this out? Basically, what should we do? This patient is in front of you. So let's take it one by one. What do we do? Let's go back to the pathophysiology. So understand what to do. Let's go back to the pathophysiology. Okay. So what did we say the problem, prime problem was? Patient getting anxious. <coughs> and anxious makes the patient listening. Listening makes the patient to be tachypneic. Okay. Tachypnea makes the patient more anxious. This leads to increased autopy. Intrinsic peep or ocular peep and cardiac arrest. Okay? Right? This is what we are looking at. We are looking at a patient going through this cycle. We have a patient going through this cycle. This is what is in front of us now. Okay? So now what do I do? Huh? What are the options that I have? What are my therapeutic options that I have? I know my problem is the fact that I am having dynamic hyperinflation. This is not a patient on the ventilator that I am going to use peep on. Dynamic hyperinflation. So what do I do? What is my first drug I think? Yeah. Sorry, one by one. Huh? What? So there are so many bronchodilators in the market. So you think of uh, nebulization of 
So uh, what do you give? Question yeah. is very clear. What do you give? You can give what all? What is the drug that you are going to give? I have a patient that is going to give me less time. You have understood why. You have understood now why I am going to get less time. So that drug that has to be written on the machine has to be very clear. What am I going to give? So what is the drug you are going to give? Salbutamol. How much will you give Salbutamol? Do you give Salbutamol? You have Salbutamol here? You want to give Levosalbutamol. How much do you want to give? See, you must know this like this. Hmm? Sorry? How does Levosalbutamol come as? How much it comes as? Huh? So, what is written in the book is albuterol. We are talking about albuterol 2.5. Huh? That albuterol is equal to salbutamol, but we are not using uh, salbutamol. We are looking So, what you are reading is different from what you are doing. Okay. So, I'll, what she is saying is 2.5. 2.5 is albuterol, which is also called as salbutamol. What we are using is levosalbutamol. Levosal, that is levolin. This is what we are having over here. Not that this is better than this or this is better than this. There is no study that says that this is better than this, this is better than this. Okay, it's equal. So what do we get here? We get it in which of concentrations? So you get as? Before that you get as? 0.31 Then you get as? 0.63 Then what do you get as? 0.2 Right? How much of the drug will go inside? Usually 10 to 12 percent. How much is going to go inside? Usually around 10 to 12 percent. There is very, uh, and what to be, uh, what the, the problem over here, there is a huge amount of dead space because of the dynamic hyperinflation that is occurring. Uh, it may not enter the entire airway, it may enter with the proximal airways, may not enter the entire airway because they may not be having gas exchange. Right? They may not be not having gas exchange. Right? So, my situation is will one nebulization work? No, I need to continue this. I need to continue. So, my orders are very clear. 1.2 amount of nebulizer, I would be 1.2, if I had more than that I would be more comfortable but I would do 1.2 every 15 to 20 because it takes 20 minutes to nebulize so 1.2 nebulization every 15 to 20 minutes for at least 1 to 2 hours for how much? 1 to 2 hours I can't say that I just nebulize, I nebulize the level zero. the order has to be very clear because it takes 15 to 20 minutes for any patient to nebulize it will be 1.2 of levolin to be nebulized Q20 minutes for 1 to 2 hours. Clear? For 1 to 2 hours. How does this work? How does this work? So what does it do? How does it do that? Yeah. So it acts on beta receptors, beta 2 receptors that are lying on your smooth muscles which then interacts and creates the release of myosin like chain kinase which then causes smooth muscles to relax. Right. So this is going to be a directly acting beta 2 agonist or a bronchodilator and these agents are called as short acting bronchodilators, bronchial air beta 2 agonists. Short acting beta 2 agonists. Here they are called as short acting beta 2 agonists. So, levolin is one of those short acting beta 2 agonists that has to be given at 1.2 every 20 minutes for at least 1 to 2 hours because we are expecting that patient to take so much time to do this. That is the first look at trying. So, I am trying to look at the pathology. I am trying to look at the pathology which is basically a constriction of the airways because of some kind of uh, increased hyperactivity. Right? Then what? Ipratropium bromide. Ipratropium bromide. Another short acting anticholinergic anti agent. How does this work? Muscarine. Muscarine receptor. How does it work? Atropine. How does it work? If that works on beta 2 receptors, this works on? Muscarine. And causes release of? Cyclic AMD. Simple, no? This one is beta 2 agonist, beta 2 receptors, myosin light chain kinase, it changes. What does the uh, acetylcholine uh, receptor, what, is it, what does this work as? as uh, acetylcholine receptor agonist, that is uh, all these uh, ipratropium and all these things will work as. It will work on the cyclic AMP, uh, which will thus cause relaxation of the smooth muscles. Here, cyclic AMP will cause relaxation, so you should know this. 
as the doctors, nurses will say, okay, I'll use bilirubin. Why? That is what we should do. Okay, huh? so acetylcholine, cyclic MP, and that's why it causes bronchodilatation. Hypertrophic bromide. How much? 0.5. Right. Here comes the number of micrograms. So it's 0.5 to be given. Actually, not it is. You can give it four times. That means interspersed with liverin. That means interspersed with liverin. You cannot say I will give one liverin. I will give hypertrophic. You don't know whether it should be given after liverin or after hypertrophic. You don't know. But an average four times in an hour. Okay, so it is it's very difficult to actually do all these things together because you're already giving every 15 minutes liverin. That's why the aeronet makes a difference. What what is the difference in the aeronet? It nebulizes faster. The aeronet nebulizes faster. So when I'm going to do this, I'm going to use an aeronet nebulizer. We nebulize faster, we nebulize completely as compared to pneumatic nebulizers. You understand? That's why I would want to use over here the aeronet nebulizer because it will nebulize faster and I'll be able to use my second drug quickly. So I have used hypertrophium chromine. Then corticosteroid. Corticosteroid. So what will be the dose here of corticosteroid? Why do you want to give corticosteroid? Anti-inflammatory. Because there is a some amount of hyperreactive airways. How does that work? How? I mean, if I want to ask you, I keep a steroid in front of you and tell you how does this work? Anti inflammatory is the effect. How does it work? How does it work? How does it work? So it works by actually causing prostaglandin synthesis in the patient, it causes phospholipase production. Phospholipase A2 inhibition. That's how it basically causes an anti inflammatory effect. Phospholipase A2 and prostaglandin synthesis inhibition. Simple. Huh? So, this is going to work. So, when, how much do I give? When do I give it? Hmm? So, on an average, there are no clear recommendations for the use of steroid. But the predominant recommendation for steroid in an emergency is a loading dose of 125 milligrams. Okay, and this is the dose for the whole day too. So, if I go to start 125 milligrams, I may want to give this patient 40 milligrams TDS after that, or 40 milligram VD after that. This is the average dose. It is not 125 four times a day. You need you know, need not give more than 125 milligrams throughout the day. Clear on this? So, my dose will be what? 125 stat and 40 milligrams TDS, which will be 120 milligrams. Clear? Or equivalent hydrocortisone. Whatever you want equivalent, jo dena hai, wo de sakte hai, hai? Huh? But this is the dose for, for the steroid. Clear? So I now have three drugs that I have given. Now what? Anxiety. <coughs> anxiety. So what do you want to do here? So what are the options that I have for anxiety? Because if I can reduce anxiety, if I reduce anxiety, the RR will get better. Huh? The patient will get less dysnic, the patient will get better. So, what do I use here? Short dose? Short dose? So, better than that is dexmedetomidine. Why is dexmedetomidine better? Sorry? So, what does that do? We want to be present. Because, why do you want dexmed? Is because of the fact that how do I know my patient is improving? How do I know when a patient is doing when I'm doing my nebulization? How do I know? It's coming down. The RRS has to come down. RR has to come down. That will tell me that this patient is improving. If I use an opioid, my RR will come down because of the opioid, not because the patient is improving. If I use benzodiazepine, my RR will come down because I use benzodiazepine, not because the patient is improving. Dexmedetomidine does not touch the respiratory rate. Since it does not touch the respiratory rate, if I see my RR coming from 35 to 18, what do I assume? It is the patient improving. You understand? So giving opioid uh, uh, is not the answer here. But giving Dexmed is probably the answer. And unfortunately, we have a problem here. What is the problem? Yes, that is the problem. The problem is here. The problem is it's a delayed response. Okay, so so how do you give Dexmed? I have done this. Loading. 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 Very good. 1 micro per kilogram per. Over there. Very good. Perfect. Now tell me what is the dose. 
Tell me how you will prepare this. So because you want to write it down, hmm. tell me. Uh, 50, uh, 200, it's coming 200 or 100 mic from uh, 200, okay. 200 milligrams and 50 cc, am I right till now? Mm -hmm. Uske baad? ML per hour? No, 4 micrograms per cc. How much ML per hour? According to weight, I'm going to... So, it is 60 kilo individual. I'm telling you, the patient in front of you. Because the weight to weight, how much is it? 60, yeah. 1 ml per kg, 60 ml will require. 60 ml. So, 15 ml per hour. Yeah, so you should be quick. Okay, you should not you should not think. So 12 to 15 ml over 20, 10 minutes and half the dose say 4 to 6 ml per hour after that. You should you should not be you should not think. I calculate the dose dose. Perfect dose. 1 microgram per kilogram per minute for the first 10 days, 10 minutes, followed by 0.5 milligram per hour per hour for uh, the next uh, per hour maintenance dose, which can go up to 0.8. Isn't it? That's what you normally give, right? But what you should understand practically in that in that hurry is so 250 12 ml over uh, 10 minutes de do, or fir 5 ml per hour chalu karo. Huh? Because you have less time. This patient is going to get sedated at 15 20 minutes. Not now. After give the dose, it's still going to take time. It doesn't immediately cause sedation. By that time, this patient may arrest. So this has to be simultaneously started. And I'm going to start the patient on dexmedetomidine. It has to be started. What do I do now? It's not, to, it's not going to work fast. What do I do? I may want to give an extremely short acting drug that will give anxiety relief. Tell me one drug that does that. Serenase. Simple. Doesn't change the respiratory rate. Doesn't do anything. Reduces the anxiety. Serenase. Okay. Small dose serenase. You understand? Small dose serenase will probably help you to get around this. I don't have serenase. What do I do? Then I have last the next option that I have in my hand is is opioid only. If I not don't have is uh, anything else, I am left with opioid. Right? I am left with opioid there, and then I will give a very small dose of opioid, very very small dose of opioid, just to get down the anxiety. Now I don't know what is the anxiety dose of opioid. There is nothing like an anxiety dose of opioid. Okay, there is a pain relief dose. We know two microgram per kilogram is pain relief dose, and a seizure dose we know ten microgram per kilogram. But we don't have an anxiety dose for fentanyl. It is not used for anxiety, anti-anxiety. It is used for everything else but it's not used for anti-anxiety. It's not an anxiolytic. Huh? So if you want to give a small dose. But our preference would be first, number one would be starting Dexem. I will start Dexem but that's not going to help me much. I am going to give a small dose of Serenase. Huh? This will probably help me. And third, I will think of giving maybe opioids. Short acting. Okay. Uh, so that that time period is uh, artificially is RR has come down. For that time, I don't want you to arrest. Clear? I don't want to do that time period. I am going to give this particular drug. Clear? So, four drugs I have already thought about, which I have to give. Which are the four drugs starting with? Saba. 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 Uh, short acting beta 2 agonist. That is anticholinergic and acetylcholine receptor medicines. Then, corticosteroids. Hello? Yeah. Certain. These four things I cannot not have it on my sheet. These are my immediate treatments. One that will reduce my anxiety, one that will help me to reduce my RR, one that will help me to reduce my dyspnea and my tachypnea, which is the basic problem that will go into this phase. Are you understanding? So these four drugs have to be there on your, on your sheet. These four drugs have to be there on your sheet. Okay. Now let's go ahead. What are the other drugs that you may want to try? These are the drugs that will work. Huh? There are other drugs that may or may not work. So which are the other drugs? Adrenaline, amino amino Okay, so let's go one by one. Let's go one by one. Okay, let's go one by one. Now that you're thinking that this patient is not improving, it's been it's been 15 minutes, it's been 20 minutes, the patient is not subjecting. Of course, by now you would have understood that we can't leave this patient alone. That you have understood. You can't leave this patient alone. You would need, need to be bedside in this patient. Okay. So uh, you decided that this patient is not improving, you've given already two doses, three doses of whatever we have to give. Uh, of Nivole, Nambiparatropium or the patient is still breathless. patient still looks bad. RR has not improved. Uh, that means there needs to be something done more. So there are certain drugs in our hand that we can use. What are the drugs? Let's go. Magnesium sulfate. So before that, um, in order of preference, in order of preference, adrenaline. adrenaline. This patient is now going to arrest. 
this patient is closely going to arrest now. It's not that patient that is Pandra Mid okay. We are in that cycle. Patient is going to arrest. What is our drug of choice when you are arrest? <laughs> so our fight or flight response is always managed well by adrenaline. How much do we do? How? 0 0.04 uh, milligram per kg in three divided doses. Which is the root? Sub Q. I am. The root is I am. And I would give 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams. I do not. Clear? Huh? 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams. I do not. Or I want to give it as IV, as a continuous injury. In our rate, it is 8 in 50 at 1.3 ml per hour. That is our rate that we give. 0 0.3 microgram per kilogram per inch. Huh? So this is where we are at. Okay, so this is our aim. I don't know how to change this. Why? Because this is going to be very, very problematic drug. Why is it going to be problematic? Because A, I cannot titrate this part. B, this part is going to cause me tachycardia. That is B. So not a great drug to give. Compared to the four, first four drugs that we talked about, not a great drug to give. But we are driven to the wall, hence we are trying to use adrenaline. The people have used racemic, have you had adrenaline in the nebulized form? Don't know whether that works or not. Uh, but this is something that you probably want to do. Then, amylophile. Again, a drug which has very high toxicity potential. Very, very high toxicity potential. And uh, but when we do it to the wall, I will try to use amylophile. Again, I will put 250 mg in a 500 ml and give it slowly uh, and see what happens. This is the titrable dose. Okay, then. Sorry? Magnesium sulfate, yeah, magnesium sulfate. I give magnesium sulfate 2 grams in 100 ml of normal saline to be given slowly over say 20 minutes. Magnesium sulfate. My next drug I'm going to give is magnesium sulfate. Okay, this is after all these, have, after I finish all those four, then I will not, uh, you know, starting me only give adrenaline, starting me only give magnesium, I know it doesn't work that well as compared to the earlier ones. You understand? Huh? And the fourth drug? Okay, Eos. 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 Okay. Uh, so these are the four things, alternatives that we have. Once we have gone through our critical phase of asthma and all these things, once it's in that as critical phase. Now comes more interesting. What happens when you go to intubate this patient? What do you use? Now this patient is worsening. We have gone through all these things and he's worsened. So there are a few things that we want to do in these cases when we are going to intubate these patients. Okay. And that is what you must understand reflexively. Reflexively, what you're supposed to do. Reflexively, what you're supposed to do is if the pH is very low, if the pH is very low, he doesn't have the time to compensate. Normally, what happens is the pH is low in, in kidney failure, bicarbonate will jayega. COPD will jayega. COPD, not kidney failure. COPD, what happens? Because the patient is having PCO2, 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 COP. What happened here? He doesn't have this time. He compensation a time nahi. So his pH, his ka 40 agar ho gaya, so your pH 7.1 ho jayega. So your bicarbonate will remain at say 16 or 17. It is not going to go up. It is not going to go up. So there is actually a bicarbonate deficit here. So now what is happening? The body wants the bicarbonate. The body wants the bicarbonate. Body is not able to compensate. That is why the body wants that bicarbonate. So this is one place where you want to give bicarbonate. This is one place where you actually want to give bicarbonate, especially around the intubation time. Huh? Especially around the intubation. You might think if I give carbon dioxide, the CO2 will go up huh? and all these problems occur. It's okay, I'm about to intubate him. I'm about to intubate him. I don't want him that I intubate and he crashes because of his acidosis that he's having. You understand me? I don't want that to occur. How much how much will the how much will the bicarbonate cause the PCO to go up? Each ampule causes a PCO go by 3 millimoles. 3. Okay, 3. So 2 will cause it to be go 6. You will breathe that out. 3 or 6 will breathe that It's not 100. It's not 50. It's 3 millimoles. Huh? You can breathe that out. You understand? But it gives bicarbonate. It gives bicarbonate as a byproduct which is required for this particular patient. So around intubation, I want to make it safe. So I'll probably think of giving bicarbonate in these cases. Here, a small amount of bicarbonate, maybe 50 ml, uh, maybe uh, uh, 100 ml, maybe 50 ml, something that I want to give. Okay, this is because I want to keep the patient kind of safe. This is the only place, one of the few places in medicine 
when we think of giving bicarbonate around intubation. Around intubation, right? That is my first thing. My second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to keep a very close watch on the hemodynamics. So I can't have my blood pressure to be cycling once in hour or once in 30 minutes. I'm cycling every minute or I have an article in place. Because the, my major problem is what? Cardiac arrest. My major problem is cardiac arrest. Imagine that the patient was not receiving volume and now you are giving volume. Patient was not getting volume, right? Because it was not moving only, there was no gas exchange. And now what have you done? You have caused gas exchange to occur. That means more air is going in. By the 500 mm, is 350 mm. Now, it's 350 mm. Maybe dynamic hyper only 100 was going inside. Now, you are putting the whole 500 mm inside. So, you can imagine the amount of autopeak that you going to generate. You understand? You are understanding this? So, he can arrest at that moment. He is at that level where his dynamic hyper inflation has caused him to breathe less, autopeak has increased, that's why he is dysnic. And at that time, if you force in the 500 mm, he is gone. So you have to be very careful, very very careful at this rate. So what will I do? I will be clear. My tidal volume will be set at 6 ml per kilogram. I don't want to give him 600 ml if he is 50 kilos in weight. Huh? Okay, if he is if he is 50 kilos in weight, I will want to give 300. I don't want to make that 400. I don't want to make that 350 also. Okay, it has to be the lowest volume that we can give in these cases. Of course, I can't make it 100. Why? Why can't I keep it? You say 300 rupees, 100 rupees, no, yes, sir, just follow me, you 100 rupees. Huh? Sorry? If I give 100 rupees, what is the problem? I said just now 300 ml, reduce the volume, see, give the volume, make 100 ml. Why? Because it's only dead space. Exactly, simple, no? You took dead space, what is it? Your dead space is 2.2 ml. Huh? So 2.2 into 50 is 100 ml. We are not dead space. Dead, you understand? It is only dead space. So if you are just going to ventilate a dead space, what is the point of reducing that? You have to ventilate properly, no? You got the point. He will die otherwise. There is no ventilation. You understand? Carbon dioxide will just keep on going up, going up, going up, and he will die. Huh? You are understanding here? Huh? Here, our ventilation is not to get the carbon dioxide down. Here, our ventilation is to prevent the Cardiac arrest. That is the underlying principle that all of you should have in your mind. I am not doing this to reduce my carbon dioxide. I am doing this to prevent him from cardiac arrest. That is all that I am trying to do. So whatever I am trying to do, I am only preventing cardiac arrest. That means oxygen is going inside, carbon dioxide nikla to nikla ne nikla to nikla to carbon dioxide powder is not chai. Clear on this? Because I cannot get my carbon dioxide out here unless the airways become bigger. Airways have not become bigger. Are you understanding? The only thing I am trying to do is prevent a cardiac arrest. So the first thing that I am going to do over here is get my tidal volume at 6 mm per kilogram. Huh? What do I keep my respiratory rate as? Low as possible. See around 12. 10 or 12. Why? Because I know, I know that if I keep a higher respiratory rate, I will develop more auto control. This I know. Right? What will be my FR2? Highest possible. As of now, to begin with. To begin with, I am giving a high FR2. It doesn't make a difference. FR2 doesn't really make a difference at all in these patients. It does not make a difference at all in these patients. Okay? So, FR2 can give whatever you want to give. But around an intervention, it's always going to give a high FR2. That's all. Huh? Of course, I don't want it to be high. Very quickly, I want to get it down to 86. 88. Now, what is the problem with the FR2? What is going to happen when you do this? Why am I telling you quickly get this down? Any idea? So I, I said, you know, one character 100%, you saw 100%. Huh? But what is my next statement? Get it down as quickly as possible. Why? We want to prevent hyperoxia because it plunged down. I'm not very sure, but it is plunged to hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. You are near. Go ahead. So what is happening? What is happening to this patient? Huh? This patient is a very active patient. This is his alveolus. Okay. Now because there is less gas exchange, because there is less gas exchange, what is happening over here? The pulmonary circulation is big here, but constricted here. You understand me? It is big here, but constricted here. 
Why is that so? Because there is hypoxia after inhalation. Because there is hypoxia. This is advantageous. Why is it advantageous? To become more close for gas exchange. Because, because the gas exchange is diverted towards those alveoli which has better VQ ratio. So what's that? Because here this is wasted. In this, in this gas, there is no gas exchange occurring. Since there is no gas exchange occurring, this is vasoconstricted so much that none of the blood is actually moving. You understanding? So this is a protective mechanism for our body. Are you understanding? It's a protective mechanism for your body. You are understanding? Hmm? And the blood is shunted towards those alveoli that are actually having VQ, that are actually having any ventilated properly. Mm -hmm. You understand it? Now what happens? You decide, Chalo, yaar, I'm going to put the airway and everything is like, what the airway? Actually, you forward everything. What happened? You are not put oxygen in. And we know oxygen moves quickly. Uh, oxygen moves quickly. Yeah. <coughs> oxygen moves quickly. <coughs> Hypoxia is gone out. Hypoxia nickel yaar. Hypoxia nickel yaar. So, what's going on? ये ओपन हो गया ये अगर ओपन हो गया तो क्या हो गया तेरे पास इतना सारा गंदा है क्यों लगी जहाँ पर भी जहाँ पर भी वेजो कंस्ट्रक्शन होके बैठा हुआ था वहाँ सबसे इधर आने लग गया तो क्या हो गया कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड पूरा सर्कुलेशन में गैस एक्सचेंज को टाइम ही नहीं है सर्कुलेशन में चला गया uh, as of now, gas exchange, it was diverted, oxygenation will drop, carbon dioxide will go here. Gas exchange suddenly changed. Clear? Desaturated. So, desaturated. Exactly. So, what is going to happen? Ye, once you give oxygen, what is going to happen? Uh, there is a huge amount of oxygen going here. There is a huge amount of oxygen going here. Now, this is all lying in the circulation. There is no movement here. There are many areas in the body. There are many areas in the body. Uh, and this is a protective mechanism. Why is this protective mechanism? Because there is no oxygen happening over here. No. Whereas in the bigger alveoli, in the proper alveoli, this big amount of gas exchange is occurring. Right? This is a big amount of gas exchange occurring. You understand this? Uh, this is a big amount of gas exchange occurring. So most of the gas is going from here and going to this alveoli and getting gas exchange. Right? You are understanding this? This is what is occurring now. We have given oxygen. Now what has happened, there is a huge, like this, there are maybe 100 more alveoli. Okay, and they all contain some blood here. Okay, now what has happened, suddenly this toxic pathway is going to release. Okay, this was the actually good alveoli. This is still bad, because gas exchange is not occurring. Now what is happening, all that oxygen, all that blood is going here, there is no gas exchange. There is still no gas exchange, no, just oxygen is there. You have not changed the gas exchange. The gas exchange is still bad here. The gas exchange is still bad. You are understanding? The gas exchange is still bad. You are understanding this? The gas exchange is still bad. Okay. All you have done is what? All you have done is what? You have just dilated this to this way. You have dilated this. There is no gas exchange. The oxygenation was occurring over here. That oxygenation also is not occurring over here because there is no gas exchange. Is your oxygen will go down na? first. O2 will go down. Na? Why will the O2 go down? Because initially this was getting good oxygenation, those gas exchanges were occurring. Now the entire blood has gone into this segment, which was the bigger segment of the lung, which is all bronchospastic, auto peeped, and all these things. So, so the, if there was 100 ml of blood, for example, 100 ml of blood, there was 40 ml of blood lying in the in the in the hypoxic in the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction bed. Okay, and 60 ml was going into the oxygenated bed. Now what has happened is, what has exactly happened is, this uh, blood that is going into the hypoxic bed is now increased into the hypoxic bed. So this is now mixing with the rest of the blood. So there will be hypoxia. Are you understanding? Yes, there is still no gas exchange. And if there is no gas exchange, what will happen to the oxygen? So paradoxically what happens is, when you put the patient on the ventilator, the oxygenation drops. So that's why we don't want to give higher amount of oxygen. We don't want to give. We are okay if the saturation is 90, 88, 90, let it be that. No problem. You want to reduce your effort, to reduce your effort, keep it low, no problem. But don't give too much of oxygen. If you give too much of oxygen, you will find the oxygenation to reduce and you will not, you will start thinking there is a pneumothorax or something like that is there which is causing the oxygenation to go down. 
You understand? This will occur in your relationship. You understood this? Have you understood this? Huh? Suddenly you have you have not changed the gas exchange. You have only changed the hypoxic pumping vessel constriction. So now all the all the blood is shunted to an area where there is no gas exchange. So oxygenation will drop. Clear? Clear on this? Alright. So this comes to how do we now set our ventilator? Okay. If I now develop autopeep, how do you find out autopeep? Now, now we have put the patient on a ventilator. We have done all these things. We have used ketamine to induce our patients because it's a very good bronchodilating agent, does not drop the blood pressure. So I've used ketamine as my bronchodilating agent, it's propofol as my bronchodilating agent. I've taken the patient rapidly deep down, sedated. I won't keep this patient awake. This is one of those patients in which I will first sedate, I will paralyze. I will put the patient on the ventilator, see my artery line quickly, look at everything, and then keep my saturation on the lower side. Huh? And then the next thing I'll do is when I have paralyzed the patient, I'll do my autopy. How do I do my autopy? What do I press? I will press an expiratory hold. So when I press an expiratory hold, let me take you an example. You have a patient, this is your waveform, okay? So you have flow. This is how you're going to see. This is how you're going to see your flow in these patients. Because of the huge amount of flow problems that he's having, flow that he's having, this is how you're going to see it. You're not going to see the waveform that someone taught you in graphics. Is uh, anything given? Is anything given? You're going to see it like this. So by visual inspection, what I'm trying to tell you, you cannot see auto peak. Because this being big, you know, this being big, the graph will be minus 200 or minus 300 by minus 300. You understand? So if this was if this was not there, it was small, then they would come to say minus 100 and then you will probably see this. Are you understanding? It's a very important practical point. Okay, that the scale other goes because this is very big. You understand? You know what I'm saying? Or no? No. So, what do you expect in a flow waveform? In a flow waveform, what you're expecting is inspiration, expiration, this. Right? This is what you expect, huh? this is expiration, right? This is what you see in the waveforms, right? So, now here, if I have this patient, if I have this patient like this, and then this is going like this, and going like this, what do I understand? No, there is an auto peep development. By flow, I can find out there is an auto peep that is here. Huh? Now, here normally the scale will be somewhere around minus 100 to plus 100. That's why you get a waveform that looks so beautiful. You get a waveform that looks so beautiful because the scale is placed like that. Okay, scale is automatically done, you can't change the scale. On a ventilator, the scale is automatically done, usually. Okay, huh? this is what is going to occur. Okay. Some ventilators have got scale changes, otherwise, automatically it comes like this. Hmm? Now, what happens in our patient of, of, uh, of uh, asthma is this is much more deeper. This one is much more deeper, expiratory, because suddenly it is not going to be able to push it. In expiration, it is not going to be able to push it. It is not going to be Constructed airways, so the flow is very high. You understand? You understand it, no? The flow is very high. If the flow is very high, then what will happen? The pressure will be lower. So, what will happen? It will go down. 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 When the scale is changed, then this graph will be like this. This is what I wanted people to understand even in the graphics and analysis. This graph has to that. You understand? When this graph is like this, you can't generate, you can't look at it and say auto peak. You can't look at it and say auto peak. You can't look at it and say auto peak. You can't look at it and say auto peak. You are understanding? But what you can see is your volume trace. What happens in a volume trace? In a volume trace, you may find the volume going up, a very prolonged expiration, and not reaching the base. You may see this in a volume trace. Huh? So on visual inspection, you may see a volume trace and say maybe this is uh, auto peep developing. But importantly, better than both of these is to actually do the maneuver. And that is expiratory hold. This is the right time to do an expiratory hold. If I do an expiratory hold, I'm looking at my pressure trace and not you understood earlier, no? Yes. Huh? So in my in my expiratory hold, I'm looking at my pressure trace. 
And what is happening in my expiratory hole? Pressure drains which is important for you to understand what we are looking at. Okay? It gives you a very good uh, indicator in these patients. Anybody can tell me what we can see in the expiratory trace in the in the pressure waveform and tell me whether this patient is improving or not. Anyone here? I expect you see. So let's give an expiratory. So this is what our normal expiration and inspiration is. Peak pressures. Huh? This is how it looks. Right? This is how it looks. Now, when I am doing, what am I doing? Expiratory hold. Huh? What is going to happen? The valve is going to close. Huh? When my valve closes, what is going to happen? Right. Suddenly, this will stop. There is no flow anymore. There is no flow anymore. So it will drop down like this and become a plateau. Because you are holding, no? And expiratory hold is a plateau. Ho gaya ho. Huh? So, this drop is your airway resistance. You understand? This drop is your airway resistance. Huh? And this is your auto peak. So, 3 seconds later, two, more than 2 seconds you have to do, you take is your auto peak. Clear? So what is actually happening when I am doing auto peak? So I am doing this. So you have alveolus, you have second alveolus, one alveolus chota hai, one alveolus bada hai, one bohati bada hai, one alag alag hai. What am I trying to indicate? That no airway is similar. No airway is similar. What do I want to figure out? What is the pressure here? 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 This is what I'm trying to simulate by finding my pressure because I'm worried about cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is going to occur when these pressures are high. You understand me? Huh? Auto peep is determining that pressure, right? Huh? So I want to see what is the pressure here. Clear on this? Am I clear till now? Huh? So if I want to hold an end expiratory hold, if I press end expiratory hold, this annual level is come out, this will come out, this will come out, this will come out. Which will come out first? This one. Yes. This one. Mm -hmm. This is going to take its time to come out. Right? So that is why I can't just touch it and look at my pressure. If I just touch it and look at my pressure, I may be looking at this and this. Okay. If I want to see the whole pressure properly, I need to wait for 2 to 3 seconds. Around 2 to 3 seconds, what is going to happen? All this will come. Probably we are thinking so all going to go into the airway and then at 2 or 3 seconds, will be seeing your exact auto peak. Clear? If I do it at 1 second, what do I get? I will, I will get these two. When I do it at 2 or 3 seconds, I will get this all together at 1. Still, I am not very certain, but this is my best approximation that I can do. You understand? Huh? Clear on this? Now, this deterioration of pressure, what is happening actually when you are giving auto peak? There is no pressure here. Exhalation valve is closed. Then what is going to happen normally? Air has to go from here and go out, right? Mm -hmm. Now what have you done? You have closed the exhalation valve. You have closed the exhalation valve. Since you have closed the exhalation valve, there is no more gas coming from here. So gas will go from here to here outside. Mm -hmm. <coughs> gas will go from here to here outside. So fast agar gas nikla, fast agar gas nikla, fast agar gas nikla, so what happened? What happened? What happened? The proper direction was good, it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Gas agar slow nikla, gas agar slow nikla, for pressure approximation ke liye. It means there is excess amount of bronchoconstriction. So that slow is this slow. So that's right. Because the pressure is going to deteriorate. I can see that. This is how it is. Mental frame is going to be like this. If you press it, it's going to be like this. You understand? So I know that if I'm going to bronchoconstriction my patients, if I'm going to do a bronchoconstriction, then I'm going to have to I am going to uh, improve this particular way. Clear? Understood? Auto peep samjha? Okay, I have done this. And I know that my pressure is 37. Ah, pressure is 37. So I have set a peep. Normally, in my ventilator, what is the peep I want to say? I have needed F5, we did tidal volume, we did RR, we did set the, we did reset the I ratio as they want us to do. Okay? Uh, for the peep, I always set a peep. You will always need to set a peep. You cannot not set a peep. So I set a peep of say 4. Uh, I set a peep of 4. Now I did an auto peep maneuver and I got 30. 
that is the total p so 30 minus 4 26 is your auto p clear 30 minus 4 that is 26 so total p is 30 total p is 30, uh, uh, total p is 30 <coughs> minus 4 is your uh, 4 is your p set p and 26 is your occult intrinsic or auto p occult intrinsic or auto p clear on this so now now how do I get this right? I am at a respiratory rate of 20, I am at a tidal volume of 400, uh, I am at a IE ratio of 1 is to 2 and I am at a uh, FiO2 of 24%. My ET is showing as 32. ET CO2, this is my RR. Oh, this is my RR. Let me RR be 18. Okay, RR 16, 16 RR. I keep a tidal volume, this is my tidal volume, this is my E ratio and this is my FIO2. I have auto P, I am worried. Why am I worried? Because there is P pressure which is going to reduce my valence return, which is going to cause problems with respect to cardiac output. This is going to cause an arrest. What do I touch first here? Uh, what do I touch I first? What well, other I ratio is there, RR is there, tidal volume is there, uh, FIO2 is there and ETCO2 is there. Pressures I found is 26 auto P. I have to help this out, patient. Other this patient go to arrest. What do I do? What do I do? He is not arrested. There is no hypotension, but he is going to. Because if now there is no auto peep hair, he is going to go into that position. But how do I treat this now? He is going to treat this now. Obviously, I have bronchodilate. He is going to come and bronchodilate. But on the way to the other way, I will decrease and I will decrease. What will you do? I will decrease and I will decrease. I will decrease. Okay, so what happens with that? So what is more important? Is IE ratio more important? Is tidal volume more important? Or is RR more important? Because that is what you want to do, right? What is more important among these three? I want to do two, three things. Remember on the ventilator, you always want to do one thing and see what happens. Now on a ventilator, now, normally you don't want to do a lot of things. If you have a problem, you don't want to do an effect. So we will not do a lot of things. ओके हां तो क्या कर रहा है क्या आप कौन सा बटन हाथ लगाओगे टाइडल वॉल्यूम आ गया आई रेशियो आ गया और आर आर आ गया टाइडल वॉल्यूम आ रहा है पुश इज आर आर सचिन एंड आलिया पुश इज आई रेशियो यू से आई रेशियो हु एक्सेस नोबडी डू डू चेंज दी टाइडल वॉल्यूम यू से टाइडल वॉल्यूम पुश इज टाइडल वॉल्यूम पुश इज आर आर पुश इज आई रेशियो सो द आंसर इज आर Answer is R. So what happens is if your I ratio is 1 is to 2, hmm? 1 is to 2, for example, and my respiratory rate is 20, for example. Okay. How much uh, seconds, 3 seconds come one breath? 1 second inspiration, uh, 0.8 second inspiration, and say 1 point something something seconds expiration, 2.2 seconds expiration. I suppose over. Huh? Is come R ko 1 is to 2 say 1 is to 4 be other than so, my I ratio is 0.6 My 2.6 is 2.8 or 3 Maximum 0.2 or 0.3 seconds will increase 0.2 or 0.3 seconds will increase But, if I make my 20 to 10 20 to 10 6 seconds breath, 2 seconds and 4 seconds You understand? My expiration will get much more bigger When I change my RR that is why I want to change my RR first. You understand? So I will change my RR and then I will see what is happening here. So do never do simultaneously too many things, you will not know what is worked. Okay. I want to start at an IE ratio 1 is to 2 to 1 is to 3, 1 is to 3 maybe. Uh, but I will not go from 1 is to 3, 1 is to 6. But what I will do, I will cut my RR down. Because I know the effect of the RR is big. The next effect is a tidal volume. IE ratio is the last one. Okay, because the effect of the tidal volume is bigger because there is a huge amount of volume going in, a huge amount of volume coming out, and it is my tidal volume. The first thing I am going to touch is the RR, the second thing I am going to touch is my tidal volume, and the third thing I am going to touch is my I ratio. And I know my I ratio now will make much of a difference for me because it is in seconds, points of seconds where it is going to change. So, clear? So, this all should be very clear in your mind because in an emergency situation, you should not, you should not do many things, you should not understand. You will not understand otherwise you put things together, you will not understand also. And you must know what is going to affect you. Okay, so the moment I do that, I am going to go back to my flow waveform to see what is happening. I am going to see FF resistance, what is happening. I am going to see all those values that I have. 
clear huh so that's about that's about how i said this now auto peep what how do you so one way you want to get the auto peep out is you want to bronco dial it that is easiest way as that's the best way get the bronco dilation in huh to ensure that there is good amount of uh, 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 place for the air to go out the second thing is you're coming down on the rr and uh, the third thing is coming down on the tidal volume huh then what is the next thing that you can do you want to show now why auto peep is a problem i explained to you why auto peep is a problem with respect to uh, patient is on the ventilator and patient is sedated and paralyzed there is no problem okay or you are worried about cardiac arrest when the patient is on the ventilator passive paralyzed sedated i am not worried about the patient not able to breathe hmm? because they are worried about what cardiac arrest when the patient is passive paralyzed and deeply sedated which we want our patients to be at this stage what am i worried about i'm worried about cardiac arrest but the other way around when my patient is not passive spontaneously breathing ha huh? spontaneously for example you move this patient from ventilation passive to spontaneous okay or he start to trigger the ventilator there comes the problem here because now what has happened this is your airway this is your lungs okay ha huh? auto peep is there in your in your this let me put the auto peep as 10 let me put auto peep as 10 this is your auto peep right ha huh? how does air move usually for air to move from here to here here there has to be negative pressure that's how you are breathing you develop a minus 4 negative pressure so air from outside rushes inside that's how you are breathing right that's how you are breathing now here what is going to happen i have to get this to minus so how much instead of breathing 4 the patient has to breathe minus 14 when he breathes minus 14 that is when air will move inside so in that clear on this he has to breathe minus 14 that means he has to breathe above the speed to move air inside So when he is in spontaneous, when he is breathing on his own, very difficult for him to breathe. That's why what do they do? How do you see COPD patients presenting in front of you? How do they? How are they in front of you? How is their appearance? And what are the? How is the lips? First lips. lips. Why the first lips are there? Peep. Peep. It's trying to create a peep. Where? At the mouth end. Peep where? At the mouth end. So what does this mean? If I now put a peep here, I say eight. I am already at eight here. Huh? I am already at eight here. Huh? I just need to get it to minus two. So minus three. I don't need to generate too much of tidal volume. I need a pressure. I need only minus eight, minus two, minus minus five, or minus six or something. Not minus fourteen. So what is it? So addition of P, a smaller amount of P, in a patient with auto P. Will actually cause the patient in spontaneous breathing to breathe well. Not in the patient who is passive. Passive may also auto peep, but not in the patient who is auto peeping. There is no point. You understand? But in a patient who is active, if I wanted to breathe well, I need to put a small amount of peep here so that he can now generate this negative pressure and trigger the ventilator. Otherwise, the ventilator will not get triggered. For triggering the ventilator, what is the ventilator looking at? How much is the pressure he is generating here? Ventilator is not looking at diaphragm. बेंडल लुकिंग इतना इधर कितना प्रेशर जनरेट हो रहा है इट्स मॉनिटरिंग राइट इन द ट्यूब बेंड यू अंडरस्टैंड सो इफ यू हैव गेट 8 एंड 10 यू विल जनरेट -5 इजीली समझ में आ रहा है दैट इज द फिनोमेनन ऑफ ऑटो पीप टू एक्सप्लेन दिस यूजुअली यू नो ऑन योर इनियर थ्योरी इन योर थ्योरी इफ यू रीड योर थ्योरी इज समथिंग कॉल्ड एज वाटरफॉल हाइपोथेसिस यस इन द थ्योरी हैव यू रीड वाटरफॉल हाइपोथेसिस यू रीड व्हाट डज इट मीन So that is different. That is mechanical. That is what I am saying to, to any patient of uh, asthma. I want to keep that small amount of peep because the peep will be like a strut to keep it open for any patient of asthma. I will keep peep of say four or five so that it keeps the airway open. But that's not what I am talking about. What is the waterfall method? So the question is, how does peep? I explained to you how does peep help. How does extra peep help here? But it is very difficult to understand. How peep to there you are. Patient already peep. You are giving peep. Already has peep. What are you doing? 
the thinking is like that no so that is why the waterfall analogy is thought about now what is that it's a theoretical thing but uh, it is there in every book you have not read it it is every book of utopic will have waterfall hypothesis <coughs> okay so what is that this is a stream this is a stream okay this is a stream there is water dropping like this in the stream and then going down like this okay this is your alveolus this is your airway okay ha huh? this is your constricted airway and this is your normal airway or et tube so in your waterfall there is a hill there is water there is stream ha huh? there is a waterfall and there is a stream hmm so if i keep so my question my this was why only 8 if i if i had this over here and i'm putting only 8 why not put 12 go back to the earlier thing that i talked to you about what i talked to you about i said that if you have if you have like this ha huh? if i have uh, 10 peep inside the alveoli and i'm giving 8 peep why not give 12 simplest enough for the patient एग्जाम्पल This is your airway. This is your airway, okay, which is constricted, and this is your airway that is not constricted and has got a tube. Okay, now I am going to increase the peep here. Okay, so I can keep on increasing the peep. Will the flow change? The flow is never going to change because I am just increasing it here. When the peep reaches, or when the flow. or this which is here that is when the flow will deteriorate that is when this waterfall will stop working there will not be waterfall anymore you understand so downstream pressure you increase nothing will happen to the upstream pressure to a certain critical opening pressure a critical pressure at that critical pressure at that critical pressure you will negate everything and this pressure will now overflow here This pressure will now overflow here. That critical pressure, this is an analogy, okay? That critical pressure is somewhere around 75 to 80 percent of your total peak, of your autopeak. Sorry, is around 70 to 80 percent of your autopeak. Understood? Is it understood finally, or no? Yeah. Huh? The question was, why can't you go up on the peak? Why can't you go up now? Yes, this is the analogy for that. That you go up, go up, go up, go up, go up, no problem. So two peep, three peep, four peep, seven peep, no problem. But when you reach the critical opening peep, critical peep it's called. When you reach the critical peep, this water will overflow here and add on to this peep here and worsen your autopeak. That is why finding out your intrinsic peep is very important in these patients. You may end up doing something that is wrong. You understand? Ah, huh? that is why. Finding up the intrinsic peep is very very important. So if I have intrinsic peep of twenty, I can give ten, I can give twelve. It's fifty percent. It's not even seventy percent. You understand? Huh? I shouldn't be thinking too much because it's going to help. When it is going to help? When the patient starts weaning off. Our problem is when the patient starts weaning off. No, it's not otherwise. You understand? The patient starts weaning off. His lungs are always like that. Only bada peep. What will he do? इसको को निकालने का इसमें से तो पीप ज्यादा रखो यू अंडरस्टैंड सो दिस लकर इट एवरी पेशेंट हु गॉट एन एयरवे दैट इज हाइपर रिस्पोंसिबल फॉर एग्जांपल वी हैड द द ओल्ड मैन हु वाज ऑन इसोफेजियल मैनोमेट्री आवर टेक्नीशियंस फादर टेक्नीशियंस हस्बैंड वी केप्ट द पीप हाई व्हेन यू आर वीनिंग हिम ऑफ वी टुक हिम ऑफ एंड केप्ट द पीप हाई व्हाट वी आर लुकिंग एट ओबेसिटी इज यू ओपीडी ऑल द नॉनसेंस दैट वाज ओवर देयर एंड वी गॉट हिम ऑफ द वेंटिलेटर इजंट इट We we moved it from eight peep to zero. You saw that, right? We moved it from eight peep to a extubated. 
Why do you do that? Because this is what you are looking at. Huh? He had an airway that was kind of not okay. Bronchospasm, things like that. All these things are occurring on him. Clear? So this is about uh, uh, autopy. Okay. So now we've understood uh, how to maintain the ventilator, how to be normal. So now, okay. How we start with what are the pharmacotherapy, and this is the entire topic on asthma. Are there any questions here now? Are there questions on asthma? We have probably gone through everything. Huh? We have gone through everything, and I, I don't think uh, I think uh, this lecture you should listen it again later on. You will realize that you will not have read it anywhere anywhere in uh, in medicine anywhere. Huh? This concept concepts will become clear. Concepts will become clear. All these things are so important that tomorrow when you ask what is waterfall hypothesis, you will probably not know what it is all about. Unless you know this, that I've just not talked to you. So, learn it. Huh? Okay. So.